Hello, I'm George Liston, CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. One admirer described him as pure act. Theodore Roosevelt was indeed our most kinetic president. A whirlwind of human energy, he enjoyed a celebrity rare in presidential politics, largely because he symbolized the active passions of a nation on the move. But there was an engaged and first-rate mind behind all that frenetic activity. Roosevelt operated from a personally constructed philosophy that blended some of the most advanced and some of the most regressive theories of his day. It was a coherent, fiercely held system of belief that was massively influential in its day and important to understand in ours. Ideas are the lifeblood of democracy, and the thought of Theodore Roosevelt is an essential element in the ongoing narrative of this country. My guest is Joshua David Hawley, author of Theodore Roosevelt, Preacher of Righteousness. Joshua, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. And it's great to have you here. And let me hold up your fine book so that people can see it, and uh, we do hope get to read it. Um, Let's start uh, right at the start, Joshua, by setting the stage in a sense. And here's my sense of, of the stage, you might say. From his birth in 1858 to his death in 1919, I get the impression of an America that's uh, very much a nation in flux, you know, moving from a rural to an urban uh, structure, agrarian to industrial, um, the forces of finance, of immigration and science, all these things, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Would you say, or could it be said, that there's an underlying intellectual flux as well in the sense of a debate about some of the en enduring questions of our republic, that is, you know, what liberty means, what citizenship means, that this too is part of the atmosphere in which he comes of age? Absolutely. Uh, there really is uh, a sense of great intellectual churning mm -hmm. going on from the time that Roosevelt is born, just on the eve of the Civil War, exactly. uh, right through uh, the Gilded Age and on through the Progressive Era, which of course he did so much uh, mm -hmm. to lead and to make possible. Uh, the Atlantic Monthly ran a, a fascinating piece in the late 1880s called A Moral Interregnum. Mm -hmm. And I love this little piece. It's, it's just a, a, a few series of pages, but the, the basic idea that the author argues for is that uh, Western society and the United States in particular is in a transition from a series of a moral framework, if you mm -hmm. like, that had acted as a sort of a common base uh, for Americans right through the middle of the 19th century, but that due to the changing economic circumstances, changing religious beliefs, mm -hmm. that this is now under threat and is giving way. And what is going to emerge as the new reigning public philosophy, if you like, is far from clear. So right. in some sense, the piece is very hopeful. Mm -hmm. the, the future is, uh, is open, the possibilities are boundless, but it's also there's a sense of apprehension. And mm -hmm. I think it nicely captures the sense of the age. Yeah. And Roosevelt's politics was in many respects a response to that sense. Very well said. And you know where he seems to cast his vote on this business of what the new reigning uh, philosophy is going to be is very much along the lines of righteousness. Mm. This is, uh, and I, I got a kind of a sense of it growing uh, in a layered way in importance through his life, but right from the beginning, and let's discuss this word righteousness and what it seems to mean to him. Um, I have a sense, Jonathan, uh, Joshua, from this book that um, he s saw the nation as having a kind of an aggregate moral character that would derive from individual acts of, uh, or, or perfection along lines of virtue and such. But you explain what he meant right from the very start about uh, this notion of righteousness. Well, it was really something that he acquired in his childhood from his father mm -hmm. and, his, and his upbringing. Um, so Roosevelt's political science, if you like, is going to have roots both in the Republican with the lowercase r right. notion of democracy and, and how to sustain self-government, but also in his personal, personal upbringing, his personal history, mm -hmm. if you like. And that personal history was geared very much around a, a form of uh, evangelical with the lowercase e Christianity, um, placing a lot of emphasis on belief and on right action, on yeah. action in accordance with that belief. And that's really what he learned from his father. This was heavily emphasized in yeah. the Roosevelt household. You needed to to live out your mm -hmm. belief by making the world a better place, A, mm -hmm. and by becoming a better person yourself, mm -hmm. B. And of course, the senior Roosevelt, the senior Theodore, in fact, uh, was quite a model to emulate. Absolutely. An impressive man. You know, uh, these, these are two excellent points. Let me ask you one question about the kind of a 
uh, exterior atmosphere, if you will, that surrounded the Roosevelt household, in particular the notion of muscular Christianity. Is that a, a context in which we can situate this, the Rooseveltian notion of righteousness, that that was kind of the, 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 the ground in which it grew? I think so, absolutely. And the basic idea there is that uh, physical fitness, health, strength, reflects mm -hmm. moral strength. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, the two are symbiotic, if you like. So one way to improve your moral fiber is to improve your physical fitness. Right. Uh, and there's a, a, an interpretation of Christianity at work there that is laying a lot of emphasis mm -hmm. on uh, the person of Christ as a role model. Right. And a role model of strength and manliness mm -hmm. even. And so it lends itself to this, uh, to this physical interpretation. Mm -hmm. And again, that also meshes very nicely with an emphasis on working out your faith, showing your faith in works, improving the world, improving yourself. All of this comes together in the young Roosevelt's world and in his family's own history of a very proud family. A Centuries old. Absolutely, a history of being leaders in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, so these, these currents converge, if you like, to really uh, steep the young Roosevelt in the sense that he needed to live up to an ideal mm -hmm. and he needed to live out uh, both what was in him as a Roosevelt and also what he believed uh, as a young man and as a Christian. And it's remarkable also, Joshua, how consistently this plays out through his life. I mean, this does not deviate. If anything, it sort of flourishes and matures and, and flowers. Uh, in fact, uh, it, toward the later chapters when in his presidency, we will get to see him as viewing this righteousness as the responsibility of government, that it can act in a collective sense to enforce the, the ideal of righteousness. One note on his father. You're quite right, this is a lifelong model. He revered him, um, say for one particular that always seemed to have troubled him, and that was his father's lack of service in the Civil War. Yes, yes. Uh, that was, I think, uh, in the younger Roosevelt's view, Theodore Roosevelt's view, a grave defect, mm -hmm. a blemish on his, on his father's reputation yeah. and on his father's manliness, I think is not too stark a way to right, put it. exactly. And in many senses, the younger Roosevelt would try to redeem that failing. And I think you can explain, not to be, to engage in too much psychoanalysis, uh, but uh, I think that it is not too much of a stretch to say that the younger Roosevelt would feel driven to redeem that, uh, in part by his actions in Cuba uh, and his lifelong fixation on the importance of military service. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, you'll see that recur later in his, as president and in his post-presidential years, this idea that every man should serve. Mm -hmm. I think there are echoes in that of mm -hmm. his own discomfort that his father did not serve. Right. And there's also, just to add one more point there, there's a little bit of a class element. One of the reasons his father did not serve in the Civil War is because he could afford not to. Bought a substitute, I believe. He did, mm -hmm. that's right. And, and Roosevelt, that would greatly discomfort him later on mm -hmm. when he came to believe uh, as a, an active politician and as president that the wealthy in the country were really shirking their civic responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that his own father had arguably shirked his responsibilities because he was wealthy bothered him. Bothered him indeed. Joshua, let's discuss a uh, uh, less noble, uh, more troubling element of the Rooseveltian uh, worldview and philosophy, and that is racialism. And this, I think, uh, merits a, a, a very profound moment or two here because it's, um, it's, it's troubling, but it's, it's, it's perhaps somewhat different than the kind of racist notions that we're associated with today. But it, it does, in its essence, I thought, uh, embrace a hierarchy of nations and, and peoples. Some people are simply better than others and have the right to impose standards of civilization upon them. You take it from there. I mean, just, just how powerful a notion was this? How enduring a notion was this for, for Theodore Roosevelt? Extremely powerful mm -hmm. uh, and extremely uh, potent uh, both for him and for his time. I mean, this is something that is very much in the air, again, by the time he was born and through his early childhood, and that he folds into his political science. So uh, much of his politics will turn on this idea uh, that individuals can acquire uh, moral character tra character traits and then pass them on yeah. to their offspring. Yeah. So we have an, an evolutionary view there, but of a sort of, of a particular kind, a Lamarckian kind. Exactly. And Roosevelt would identify himself as a Lamarckian. Uh -huh. uh, and you're quite right to think that this, at the end of the day, this did result in a hierarchy of nations or civilizations, and he put, famously, the English-speaking peoples at the top. He did, and then he, uh, that allowed him to reserve a special place for the Americans, because, uh, first of all, he begins with the Teutonic peoples mm -hmm. as kind of the ultimate, 
and then uh, Anglo-Saxons as being, well, the uh, super ultimate, if there can be such a thing of that. Mm -hmm. But that that torch, in a sense, could pass to the Americans, mm -hmm. uh, that this would be the new expression of an Anglo-Saxon ma mastery of the world. Was that, is that how the progression went? Absolutely. And our frontier, the American frontier, uh, yeah. that plays a big role in that story. Mm -hmm. Because the way he sees it working is uh, the English-speaking race, when it came to the United States, had a whole new opportunity, a whole new field for conquest and uh, in the frontier, an opportunity to really steal themselves and prove their moral worth. And this mm -hmm. was going to strengthen them as a race and was going to make the uh, English-speaking race that had come to the United States a distinct people. They would acquire new characteristics in settling the West that would make them stronger, more viral, more mm -hmm. hardy, better at self-government, you know, yeah. Democrats with a small d. And this was going to elevate the Americans right to the top you of know, the racial chain. I can't resist saying at this very point, Josh, because he actually lives this out. Mm. And I'm thinking of the Dakotas. Absolutely. This is the experience after that terrible loss of both his mother and his wife, and then he, moved, he goes out there for an extended period, well, several visits of extended time. But he develops this belief in just what you've said, and I got the sense of the cowboy, the Westerner, as a particular embodiment of this notion, uh, and that this notion leads to, or reinforces, his idea of the warrior as the ideal type. I think in, in interacting with these cowboys, uh, in, in the Dakotas, uh, he saw there before him with his eyes things that he'd only, an embodiment of something he'd only ever read about. You've got to remember also that this was a, Roosevelt himself was a, a very sickly young child. That's right, asthmatic. Famously yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And so there's this strong personal ambition in him to make himself strong. This gets mm -hmm. back to his politics having roots in his personal history. When he sees these, these cowboys out in the West, these are the very embodiment of what he wants to be. These are the people right out of the adventure stories that he read as a young yeah. man. And so that is, has a very profound and powerful effect on him personally, mm -hmm. but it also uh, lends a new twist to his political thinking because mm -hmm. he begins to think, well, look what kind of men these men are yeah. by virtue of where they're living and what they've done. Maybe right. the whole country, maybe the whole race is like that. Maybe yeah. it's explainable in those terms. But, you know, it also adds something else, I would think, and I, I think the book points this out, that violence also is, as yes. a method of getting your way mm -hmm. is justifiable if you are of this... A superior type. Absolutely. And this becomes something he's not afraid to use. Uh, there's a very uh, a dark underside to Roosevelt's moral theory, if you like, if, uh, his, his, his ethics. And, and that is, at the end of the day, he seems to think um, that the moral superstructure that we all embrace, common morality, is founded on violence in the sense that the strong prevail. And right. there's nothing wrong necessarily with the strong prevailing because that's how it should be. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a sense, the, the ideas chase one another. He thinks that it's okay for the strong to prevail because the virtuous are the strong. Mm -hmm. But in a certain sense, he thinks the strong are virtuous because they're strong. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a circle there, but the the point is is that violence is is very much a part of his worldview. He does mm -hmm. not shy away from it. In his books, The Winning of the West, which helped make him famous as a scholar, he embraces this forthrightly, makes no apologies for the atrocities of white American settlers perpetrated on Native, Native Americans. Americans. Uh, and this this is something that uh, it's very central to him, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. in my view. As uh, in, in, the, in the course of, of maturing, uh, growing, he decides upon public service as his field of action, and that's, that's a fortuitous choice for, for the nation, really. And he really moves up the rank, uh, you know, assemblyman, civil service commissioner, police chief, governor, etc. All the while, his, his notions, his theories, his philosophy, uh, Joshua, I get the sense, are maturing. Um, we're covering a lot of ground here in just a few minutes, but I'm trying to get a notion of when he begins to decide upon this uh, notion, which will flourish in his, his presidency, of righteousness as, again, a collective expression, the government is the moral agent, mm -hmm. that it can make this happen, and, and, and this kind of co-identity of the people with their government. I mean, how does this, because, and the reason I ask this question, it's fundamental to what he thinks and how he thinks it. It's also, I thought, and I thought this is one, one of the points you, uh, you made here, uh, at variance with some of the Founding Fathers' notions about the importance of the individual. I mean, how does this come about? He, he, it is at variance with the Founding Fathers. There's a significant tension there because while he picks up the Founders' ideas that democracy 
is a moral undertaking in the sense that it requires a certain kind of person to sustain it. Oh, this is Benjamin Franklin's famous quip uh, when asked after leaving the Constitutional Convention what they had wrought. Right, you know, you know, a republic, if, if, you, if you can, can keep, keep it. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the, that's the Republican with a lowercase r mm -hmm. theme there. Roosevelt picks that up, but what he adds is the idea that, well, government, as you say, can act directly on the populace to inculcate these virtues, these right. moral characteristics. And he slides back and forth between two versions of this idea. One version is, well, government ought to intervene in targeted ways to make sure that civil society is healthy. Because if you've got a healthy civil society, that's where people will be able to pick up the characteristics that will sustain democracy uh, and will be able to practice liberty. That, that's one version. The other version is government itself mm -hmm. ought to try and act directly on the citizenry to foster these moral virtues. He says both at different times. Mm -hmm. One, I think, is, is very much in keeping with the earlier American tradition. The other uh, is a little coercive, and Woodrow right. Wilson will hit him for that very hard. Absolutely, because it will become kind of a struggle between the two of them for the mantle of leadership of progressivism and Wilson will hit him hard and on the basis of individualism. How do the public accept this notion, though? I mean, because one of the reasons he's doing this, and this, going back to the age of flux, so it's the age of industrialization, of major trust, combination is the word he uses. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he's, he's waging fights in, in, on behalf of railroad regulation and other things, and uh, at the same time he's working from this course of philosophy. Is the public receptive to this Rooseveltian view of the use of power? They are receptive to the extent that it, Roosevelt continually accents the need for government reform and mm -hmm. for social improvement. Right. And that was something that, that the public was ready for. Roosevelt the reformer. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you, you have in this period emerging in the late 19th century a whole smattering of different reform groups. So this passion for reform and really for social improvement was the way that Americans of all different walks of life reacted, interestingly, mm -hmm. uh, to, to the uh, industrial age. And so you have everybody from uh, the, the, the settlement house workers in the cities to the good government reformers who tended to be municipal reformers, mm -hmm. uh, anti-corruption folks, uh, to groups like the Grangers and the National exactly. Farmers Alliance yeah, you know, yeah, who, are, yeah. who are Western and Southern farmers yeah, and yeah. shippers who are concerned that the dominance of the railroads is, uh, is eroding the, uh, the economy of independent producers, uh, to the social gospel uh, folks who are uh, uh, religious reformers who want to see society improved and, 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 and uh, brought into uh, accord with religious ideals. So you have a spectrum of folks all advocating uh, different sorts of reform, mm -hmm. but all along the lines, there's a moral component, a strong moral component mm -hmm. to all of those. Roosevelt picks that up, so his righteousness theme in some sense brings all of those things together and he directs it towards reform on the national level through the agency of the federal government. And here's, and he, and here's the irony and the accomplishment of that. Because to do that, and we're talking here about the creation of agencies to regulate uh, commerce of various kinds in particular, um, he expands the federal bureaucratic structure enormously. And I think the rationale is that they're, they're farther removed from the dangers of corruption than, than congressional legislators might be. Um, that's a double-edged sword because uh, they're not really in a sense. It certainly is. As, as we've discovered, <laughs> as we've discovered. <laughs> over the years, he didn't have the benefit of our uh -huh. experience. But Roosevelt, uh, in many ways, is the father of the modern administrative state. Yes. He always saw the administrative state, however, as the presidential state. Uh, mm -hmm. He always he saw it through the, his own lens, the lens of the White House. So what he imagined, what he was trying to do was break the nexus of party leaders in Congress political bosses at the state and local level, and then industry. Mm -hmm. And he thought by uh, setting up these regulatory agencies that would have authority to promulgate rules and then to enforce them, but that would be independent, not elected, appointed by uh, the president and with some oversight by Congress, that you would be able to take uh, a lot of the regulation of, of the industrial economy out of politics, mm -hmm. so to speak, and that this would have a uh, a cleansing, cleansing effect. effect. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Now, as it turns out, this was ar arguably did not happen and created a whole new host of problems, not the least of which is a democratic deficit problem. These folks who are who are now essentially run the American state are not themselves elected and in many senses are not accountable. Mm -hmm. He didn't foresee that necessarily. Mm -hmm. He always imagined them being accountable to him, to yeah, the president. Yeah, as a president. Exactly. And that's not how it's worked. Yeah. And, one, and one could argue not how it should work, because mm -hmm. what would happen is you'd have an incredibly strong, overweening executive Precisely. branch. Precisely. A terribly imbalanced presidency. Um, given his ego, this might have been inevitable no matter who succeeded him, but he was certainly dissatisfied with Taft. Mm -hmm. 
we felt, let him down. He was, at this point, beginning that famous bitter rivalry with Wilson. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, of course, all feeds into the Bull Moose uh, era of his latter political years. Joshua, I got the sense that uh, the, the philosophy of righteousness and its expression in these years gets harder, gets even more uh, biting, if you will, more, more pointed. Uh, we see, and, and maybe it's, this is a bit late, I'm trying, I hope I haven't confused this, because there's a worrisome element of eugenics and such coming into his message in the later uh, feisty political years of his life. Is that right? That is right. And, and you do see that emerge in new force uh, mm -hmm. in the later years, partly because the eugenics movement mm -hmm. picks up the science or, or pseudoscience of mm -hmm. eugenics. Uh, is something that really comes into vogue mm -hmm. in the early 20th century. So that racial element that we discussed earlier is present in his life and in his politics yeah. from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. But this idea that uh, through selective breeding and so forth, you might be able to, or the state might be able to uh, wean out the undesirables from the population, well, that, that proves to be a very attractive, in some sense, useful idea mm -hmm. that fits all too easily with the racial aspect mm -hmm. of his politics. Yeah. There's, a, I think, a question as to, in, in Roosevelt's defense, as to whether or not this ugly racialism and its eugenic expression uh, that we really see after uh, 1912 and after uh, in his last years, if that is really central to his politics, or if it is, as, as I say in the book, a sort of vulgar characterization mm -hmm, of it, mm -hmm. a caricature, rather, mm -hmm, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to think it's the latter. Would so like would I, so would I. Sense. But, I, but I, as you might agree from our vantage point, it's uncomfortable for us because we see what the later century brought mm. in terms of these, you know, the, the extraordinarily awful manifestations of this kind mm -hmm. of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, the duel, if you will, with Wilson, I would think ends with Wilson's uh, victory in a sense of taking the uh, progressive leadership mantle. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, how does he do it, Joshua? One notion I have is that he goes back to the Founding Fathers' ideals and puts them at the core of his notion of progressivism, but you tell us. He, d he d I think that's right. I agree with that. He, what he does is he goes back and picks up the libertarian, the powerful libertarian strand in, in American, in the American political tradition, and he says, you know, Roosevelt talks all the time about government doing good mm -hmm. and about government making us better people. And Wilson says, I don't want government to make me a better person. I want government to get out of my life so that I can do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. That's what it means to be free. To be free doesn't mean to be made into a better person or to, uh, to agree on, uh, on some common set of ideals with your countrymen and practice, practice those together. That's nonsense. What, to be free means to, to do what you want to do within mm -hmm. the bounds of the law. And he mm -hmm. says, government ought to get out of the way. That right. was a very powerful critique, mm -hmm. very, very powerful, especially when he linked it uh, to Roosevelt's uh, corporatism. That is, Roosevelt's idea that the government shouldn't break up the corporate, huge corporate combinations, the trust, but it should, if a, the ideal scenario is it should just regulate them. And Wilson right. said, don't regulate them, break them up, and get government out of the business of managing things, mm -hmm. beginning with managing individuals' lives and from there managing the economy. Tell me, you know, there's, there's one word I, that appears again at the, uh, this point in the book um, that gets famous much later in our history as well, and that's normalcy. And I, I was wondering, um, was also part of uh, Wilson's appeal just the fact that there was, the Rooseveltian approach was almost too rigorous, too vigorous to be sustained. You just wore people out. I think that's right. With it. Uh -huh. I think that's right. You, the, the Roosevelt strenuosity, if mm -hmm. you liked, and strenuous was a favorite word of mm -hmm. his, uh, is demanding and, and exhausting, publicly exhausting. And I think the, the constant calls for moral improvement, social improvement, government reform, social reform, while inspiring uh, by the, you know, 1912 had begun to run their course, mm -hmm. and, and especially after the First World War. I mean, the First World War will effectively end the progressive movement, partly for this reason. The reformative ambitions or reformist ambitions of the American public are really spent mm -hmm. after, after that war um, and, and its grand undertakings. So I think there is a sense in which Wilson says, you know, enough of these, these strenuous undertakings. Let's just have a government that does a few things well. Mm -hmm. Let's have a robust, efficient economy that allows individuals to uh, pursue the walks of life that they want, and, and let's call it good at that. There's, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. That's yeah. what government ought to do. And I, there's a, an audience for that. Right. Although I should say, I hasten to add, a minority audience. Wilson was ever a minority president. This is why I'm glad you added that, because I'm trying to get a sense of... Uh, 
you know, and people were worn out. The war had had, had pretty much exhausted reformist notions, etc. But does it? It didn't die in, in immediate death, does it? I mean, how, how how does it play out? I guess is what I'm saying. Well, we see. Uh, the, the, the themes that, that Roosevelt developed and even a lot of his ideas will be picked up by the New Dealers. In, All right, in the that's true. His cousin so will come cousin, in and make right. use of this. That's right, so they will be in a certain sense, yeah. it's a, the Phoenix uh -huh. reborn there uh, from uh -huh. the ashes in a different sense. A, a, a fascinating and somewhat historically ironic sense in that Franklin Roosevelt will say uh, to an aide at one point that he is the compromising. His program, the New Deal, represents a compromise between Roosevelt's new nationalism and Wilson's new freedom. Now what he meant by that, I'm not entirely sure, but what I think in practice you see is Franklin Roosevelt picks up a lot of the policies of his cousin Theodore, mm -hmm. but he marshals them for the purposes of Woodrow Wilson. So the idea oh, is that's nice. we're yeah. going to use the administrative state, uh -huh. we're going to use government's regulatory powers, government's reformist powers, uh -huh. in fact, to do what? to make the economy secure for individuals, to protect individual liberty, to empower individuals to live as they choose. Now that, that last part there, that purposes part, that's a very Wilsonian notion. Roosevelt wouldn't have phrased it like that at all. Mm -hmm. So that's the Wilson part, and the government as regulatory reforming power is the Roosevelt part. That's an extremely helpful answer. I mean, it's just great to see how ideas play out in the life of this republic. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to uh, the concluding moment, indeed, of our conversation and the obvious question of what remains uh, of all of this. It's useful in this presidential year. We indeed only have one moment. I'm going to suggest that the presidency as a moral enterprise is one of the results, but you give me your quick shorthand. Well, I, uh, I think that that certainly is a, the, uh, one of the results of the Roosevelt era, but I think also what you see in this election uh, is, in many senses, this is a Roosevelt election. You have both candidates who are calling uh, for reform, right. calling for a new start in politics, and I think expressing uh, some discontent with the way politics have, have been practiced, in not just in the last 30 years, but really since Woodrow Wilson. And that makes me wonder if the ideas of Roosevelt are more relevant than ever. Fantastic end to a fantastic conversation. And a great Having book, me. too. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. I'm George Liston CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue's also on the MHZ Worldview channel, which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhznetworks.org. Join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching this week. Joshua, thank you. Thank you. The Art of Conversation, Dialogue at the Woodrow Wilson Center, features 20 years of dialogue. Distributed by the John Hopkins University Press, www.press.jhu.edu.